I literally just pulled out of my pocket the last time I, I don't wear a suit very often. Um, and I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I figured it was a bunch of attorneys and lots of judges and I needed to dress up. My dad taught me that you need to be you know, dressed like the best dressed person in the room. I'm actually not quite there. Um, but the last time I wore a suit, it looks like I was testifying at the FTC. <laughs> and this happens to be the only other time in my life that I've been in a room with more attorneys than I am right now. Um, uh, Zillow did an acquisition, closed an acquisition recently of a large competitor called Trulia. So now Zillow and Trulia are, are together and the FTC um, took a pretty hard look at it. So it took eight or nine months for us to get through that process and we got through it. But here, I'll read you the first couple lines. This will give you a sense of, 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 of me. Uh, thank you all for your time. I guess the main point I'd like to make to you all is that both Zillow and Trulia are forces for good. I think of us as a kind of justice league fighting on behalf of consumers in an industry that has seemed pretty rigged to so many for so long. All right. <laughs> you know, I gave this impassioned speech about power to the people in real estate. Um, and the commissioner of the FTC kind of nodded the whole way through uh, and said, uh, thank you very much. I'm not sure that's the issue. <laughs> Um, anyway, so how did, how, did, uh, how did I get going with this power to the people idea? Uh, and I guess what we're calling disruption here, but uh, maybe actually innovation is a better word. I think it's actually called the Innovation Summit. Uh, I was a young product manager at Microsoft, and I traveled a lot on business. This was in the early 90s, 1991. Uh, and I traveled a lot on business like many of you do. And I was really frustrated by the process uh, for booking a trip, a business trip. Uh, I had to make all these phone calls to these people that I could hear on the other end of the phone. I could hear they were working on a keyboard, clickety, clickety, click. I knew they were looking at a screen. And they were making decisions on my behalf that I felt were suboptimal. I felt that I could probably do it myself better. I found I wanted to jump through that phone line and turn the screen my way and do it myself. And so like many entrepreneurs, um, many of you among, among the, this definition, um, the, the idea was born of frustration. The idea for Expedia was born of frustration. Uh, and this is before the internet had really happened. This is 1994 now. There was this thing called America Online and CompuServe and Prodigy. And I went and took those services to Bill Gates, who I think of as my first venture capitalist, and I demonstrated what travel agents were using on those online services to look up flight schedules. And I thought, I said, Bill, why don't we give that power to the people and let people book their own trips? And that is how, uh, that is how Expedia was born. I, wanted, I was an entrepreneur and wanted to build my own company. I, I pitched Bill on the idea of funding it as an outside company from Microsoft. Um, and he laughed and he said, who are you going to hire? Why don't you start it here? And if it makes sense to spin out, we'll take a look at it. I think he never thought that would be serious. Uh, but I built, I had, had a great team of people and hired these entrepreneurial people uh, who were all fired up about this power to the people in travel thing. And we built it up, and a few years later, uh, I went to Bill and I said, it might be time to spin it out now because I want to spend $100 million te in television advertising, advertising the Expedia brand. Uh, and he said, yeah, we're not going to spend that at Microsoft. And so we spun it out in an IPO. Uh, and I'll conclude this little story by saying that would not have been possible without Mark Britton, my good friend and CEO of, and founder of Avo, who you've got, many of you guys know, who's in the room there. Uh, Mark was the very young partner at Perkins? Uh, oh shoot, sorry. <laughs> Preston Gates. He was the very young attorney at Preston, pre partner at Preston Gates who we hired to, to, from the outside to lead our IPO. Uh, and as we were putting together the IPO roadshow and the S1 and all the documents to do that, I got to know Mark, uh, loved Mark, and asked him to be the general counsel of Expedia. And he came over as a young GC, and, and Expedia became a very large uh, public company. So that's how, that's how it got going. Well, 
Rich, since Expedia, you also founded Zillow and Glassdoor, and you sit on the board now of Avo. Yep. Can you talk about how you and your colleagues have evaluated these markets uh, as you were thinking about each opportunity? Yeah, I think my, you know, I'm not difficult to figure out in my, the, the stuff that interests me in business. Um, I think that same, po give information power to the people, people armed with smartphones, the, then computers, now smartphones, who want, desperately want access to the inside information, the secret databases of an industry, the information that has been withheld to them, from them, oftentimes by people wearing nice clothes, collecting commissions, okay? They want access to that information so that they can make better decisions about finding a home, finding a rental property, finding a mortgage, finding a job, finding a, a, a good doctor to, to, for the breast augmentation that means so much to that person. This is, you're, you're chuckling, but there's a really terrific site I'm involved with called Real Self that does just that, to find a good hotel, whatever. And I have put together teams of people to address the, the information asymmetry between consumer and professional in each one of these verticals. Okay, and so I, I put together with a team of ex Expedia people, I put together Zillow, which is now the largest uh, real estate website and app, app in the world. We get you know, 90 million or so, uh, maybe, maybe more than that now with Trulia, uh, 90 million or so unique users a month. Uh, it's completely changed the, the power equation in real estate. Many of you probably, probably have used it. Uh, mortgages as well there. If, for those of you from New York, we also own a brand called Street Easy. Uh, which is the biggest real estate uh, service, uh, information service in New York. Glassdoor is one that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. This is um, real people leaving reviews on what it's like to work for big companies. How much money they make, what their titles are, how long they've been there. Do you approve of the CEO's performance? <laughs> okay, CEO approval ratings for companies, why not? Okay, so the, the, we're, we're, we're honing in on these kind of verticals that are really important to people personally or that, that have big dollar value or big emotional value and giving power to the people to bridge the information gap. And I'll mention, I'll conclude this one by, by mentioning my Barton's laws are referred to in here um, and my kind of consumer empowerment laws of the new economy, of the new digital economy are if it can be known, it will be known. If it can be free, it will be free. And if it can be rated, it will be rated. And that is simply the nature of highly dispersed, ubiquitous computing with, with constant connectivity to an internet that we all share. We will all share our opinions on everything with each other and we will demand that information be free. Rich. That's a lot to think about. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you sort of think about the legal profession and you think about what Rich just said and it's, uh, it's sobering to say the least. So let's talk about the legal profession and the delivery of legal services just a bit. In your career, you seem to have innovated a host of industries as an outsider, looking in and seeing an opportunity. And insiders have had to play catch up to what you've seen looking from the outside in. What advice do you have for legal insiders? Many of those are in here this room, not everyone. What, what advice do you have for legal industry insiders, including lawyers and judges and law school deans as, as we look at the delivery of legal services? Okay, great. I mean, I think sometimes it takes an outsider to observe with kind of naive childlike eyes you know, the kind of fundamental prob problems in an industry, the fundamental opportunities. And so I think that's why you see in so many industries um, the general rule. David mentioned Clayton Christensen talking about, he, he talks a lot about creative destruction uh, in, in industries and that most industries and companies can't cross a technology chasm to get to the other side. You guys have heard, heard these principles. There are absolutely notable exceptions uh, to industries that have, there are companies that have crossed the chasm. One we can talk about if you want is Netflix. It's a company I've been involved with since it was a private company. 
and it made the jump from purely a DVD by movies, DVDs by mail service to now the biggest streaming uh, service in the world that is creating much of its own, own content. Um, but so the outsiders have fresh eyes and they don't actually believe it when the insiders say, oh, you can't do that. Well, why? You know, why, why, why can't I do that? Oh, it's just the way it's always been. <laughs> we just, we don't do that. Well, you know, um, you know, your, your, your attorneys that are in your association, they are running small businesses, many of them. They need to, they need to engage in marketing. And they need to be creative about their marketing. Well, we have, sorry, we have, we have rules that, you know, that govern the professionalism and the behavior of this. And an outsider might come in and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. We're going to try to, we're going to, try to chip away at that fundamental belief and, and, and rewrite the rules. Um, and, and what I've found in industry after industry, including the legal industry, including realtors and mortgage brokers and plastic surgeons uh, and travel agents, in all these industries, those are just a few that I'm involved with, what I found is that there is a, a subset of the professionals in that industry who get it. They absolutely understand the power of the transformative power and innovation power of the new technology. And what they do is they get on board early. And instead of, of putting up the shields and defending against the invaders, they actually suit up and go to battle with the invaders. Maybe they're traders, and some people kind of think of them as traders, actually, in the industry. Um, but what they're doing, actually, is embracing a trend and a new reality and trying to make technology work for them rather than the other way around. And so in each of these industries, I have in my, in my mind, you know, all, all of these industries, the professionals are not going away. Lawyers are not going away. In fact, lawyers should expand as, a, expand as a percentage of total business done as a result of these new technologies. But, but and just, like re, just like realtors, uh, just like even travel agents, they should, they, it, it should be able to be a force multiplier, the technology of their services. And it should be able to take their services to a much broader set of people who maybe aren't using their services today because of the new technology. And so I have in my head what I call the lawyer of the future, or the, the, the agent of the future. And the, the lawyer of the future and the agent of the future, they use new technologies to drive new ways of acquiring customers, of serving customers, of figuring out how well they serve that customer and making sure everyone else knows that. They figure out ways to use these new marketing techniques to not only feed business for themselves, but actually begin to build organizations underneath them and hand business off to increasing to, to larger and larger groups of professionals because they know how to do this new marketing and customer service. Um, they're able to garner so much new business that they can build the new age uh, uh, law firm. And or the new age real estate brokerage, and I see this in industry after industry. So, Rich, if if you were designing this new age law firm that you just described, what would it look like? What would be the components and the structure of so, a new age law firm? So, I mean, that's really a better question for for Mark, who understands really has a deep understanding of of your industry. Um, and so, you know, I don't spend a ton of time on the front lines in the in the in the legal business. But, but I can tell you that one skill that I see common amongst all these verticals is the ability to use uh, smartphone technology and the internet in order to manage marketing. Um, and the, 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 there is a skill in a law firm now, large or small, uh, that there should be at least. And that skill is digital marketing a digital marketing person, and that person might be a lawyer or might not be a lawyer. And that is the person who understands how to use Google, and understands how to use Avvo, and understands how to use other services to acquire customers in a cost-effective way. And then understands how to help the professionals deliver their service in a more dynamic, digital way. The way, by the way, consumers want. They want, they want to text. You know, they want to email. 
You know, they, they, they want to have digital documents going back and forth. I mean, how long has that taken in this business to get digital, digital documents and digital signatures circulating? I mean, we've wanted that for a, 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 quite a long time. Um, and be able, that, that geek in the law firm, that kind of quantitative marketing geek in the law firm has to have, has to have influence. Um, I guess that's kind of a common, a common characteristic. Am I missing something, Mark? No. Okay. Rich, one of the three principles was if it can be rated, it will be rated. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit on, on what you mean by that? I think, you know, we, 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 were, we were just chatting earlier with, with, with David and, and others about uh, quality. And uh, it's tough to measure quality in, in lots of industries, but especially in legal. Um, and one of the things I've seen time and again in the, in, the, in the internet, and it really opened my eyes when Expedia purchased TripAdvisor many years ago, um, was the power of user-generated reviews. Uh, user-generated reviews, they're disturbing, I know, especially for the people being rated. It's disturbing. The hotels are angry. The restaurants for Yelp, because many of them are angry. You know, <laughs> lawyers, some of them are angry. And lo angry lawyers sue, uh, uh, which plays right into a great PR strategy, by the way. Um, uh, but people are hungry to, to view ratings when they're making big decisions. And so I basically extrapolated that across pretty much every every consumer service you can imagine, including service delivered by individuals, uh, and thought, well, eventually, everything and everyone will actually have a rating and a reputation. And this is unsettling, but I think is fundamentally true. And the sooner that those small businesses and large businesses get on board with that concept, the better off they're going to be. Because we all want to know what the quality of the, what is the quality of the interaction with that realtor? Okay, I can see that realtor's record maybe by what houses she has, you know, helped buy and sell in the neighborhoods I'm shopping for. But what did the people who worked with her think of that interaction? Well, I can actually go on Zillow now and see that. What about the mortgage broker? That's one that's kind of scary. You know, I hear this bad, ugly stuff that goes on in, in, in the mortgage business. Um, I want to pick a mortgage broker who other people have had good experiences with. It's the exact same thing uh, in law. And so one of Barton's laws is if it can be rated, it will be rated. Rich, I suspect as you've um, entered into these different industries and these sectors, I suspect it wasn't always just a really easy play. I suspect there were some roadblocks along the way. So let's use Zillow as an example. What, yeah. what frustrations did you have? What impediments were there to Zillow's ultimate success? Well, I think this room can this room can identify with kind of leaning in to the punch. I think a little bit. Um, you know, if you see a you know, per, personality-wise, if I see something that people say can't be done, um, that encourages me to think more about how to how to do it. It's kind of like itching for a fight a little bit to a certain extent, and I think there's a lot of that in your profession too. Um, uh, and so, you know, I I think that those impediments. They fuel creativity, and they, you know, I think the, the overriding thing is, from my perspective, if I am wrapped in the flag of what's right for consumers, if I wrap myself in the flag of what my mom wants and what my sisters want, okay, when they're, you know, shopping for travel or home or mortgage or a lawyer or what have you, and I know that I'm on the side of the angels because I'm fighting for the little guy, giving power to the little guy, then I can withstand any punches you know, that come at me. And in fact, I can do a little jujitsu maneuver and turn those punches into marketing. Because you know, if, if a we had this happen at Ava, maybe you've heard the story, but you know, I told Mark when we launched, you know, Mark came to me and he said, look, we're going to get sued. We're rating attorneys, for God's sakes. We're going to... We're going to get sued. And he's like, he, you know, he was stressed about it. And we got to get all prepared. And I'm like, Mark, this is going to be the best thing that ever happened when the, a really loud, you know, I can't I remember the guy's name? Berman. 
Yeah, see, Berman. Yeah, it was just like, it was a total setup. It was like laying the trap for the guy. Um, and he sued us and made really ridiculous, very public and loud arguments about why we couldn't rate him. Um, and that being wrapped in the, you know, being wrapped in this blanket of doing what's right, the shield of doing what's right for consumers, you can't, I mean, you basically can't go wrong. Um, and I've seen that in, in, in industry after industry. So I've, I've enjoyed that, actually. Well, we've identified a number of industries where you saw opportunities. Why do you see and what do you see in the legal services delivery sector that makes it attractive for this kind of innovation? I think the, the, one of the really exciting things for me about what, what is going on right now is that I th there are a lot of people out there, regular folks, who are not hiring attorneys because they're scared of them and they don't know how much it's going to cost. And they, in their circles, they don't know lawyers. You know, in our circles, we know lots, we know lots of attorneys. We went to high school with them, college with them. So we have no problem finding somebody good to, to work with. But people who have, who have troubles or basic needs who don't know attorneys oftentimes just try to wing it and do it themselves. Uh, I really see an opportunity for the new technologies. You know, every, most everybody, even the little guy, even regular folks have one of these smartphones now. And being able to reach out and package legal services in a way that takes, you know, that, that's able to help more people uh, is a pretty exciting idea to me. I think it's a market expander. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big potential market expander if the industry can get over its issues with, with a lot of the things that are associated with that. Have you entered other industries where there was a highly structured regulatory environment? Travel, mortgages, real estate, oh my god. So, so <laughs> yeah. with that in mind, yeah. how, did you, how did you maneuver and do that jujitsu move and get through some of the regulatory uh, morasses? I guess in each case it's a little different, but one of the main tools that I've used and that, that Mark is using as well with Avo is that we're not in the business of delivering the actual service in that industry. Zillow is not a real estate broker. It's an information service. Mm. It is not a mortgage broker. It's, in, it's a marketplace. Um, same with Glassdoor, same with Avo, same with RealSelf. And, and that is a it's not only a nod to that being an interesting strategic position to occupy, kind of the top of the funnel, where consumers first encounter these industries is a really interesting position, I think, to occupy strategically. But it's also a nod to the fact that down funnel is where the regulations come into play, uh, where the service is being provided. And, you know, best for me, I think, to avoid that snarl altogether and stay up funnel and to a certain extent been able to to rise to rise above it occasionally we have issues um, but you know be able to rise above it now it's in interestingly down funnel and all these verticals are very powerful industry organizations who spend quite a bit of money uh, uh, in, in DC and in in, in state lobby, state level lobbying and one of the competencies we've had to acquire in all of all of my vertical businesses is some facility in lobbying and being able to get our message out in DC and in state legislatures and and in the lob with these industry lobbying groups themselves and so it's an interesting it's an interesting little dance but it's a, it's an expertise we have we have uh, acquired over time and one of the prime tools for doing that is the provision of free data um, you know, if it can be free, it will be free. A lot of these industries really have no idea what the real data was that runs the industry. Like the real estate industry, before Zillow came along, Zillow is really the leading provider of, ec of real economic data on the real estate industry in the country. The data previous to this came from the National Association of Realtors. Okay? And that National Association of Realtors absolutely is conflicted in what it says. It, there is no time that is not a great time to buy a house from the NAR, okay? And people understand that, the government understands that, the consumers understand that. But when Zillow Group comes out and says, you know what? 
the mortgage interest tax deduction may not actually be the right public policy. People listen to that and they go, oh my God, there's somebody who's in the real estate industry saying, saying something that sounds like it's, it's against home ownership, increased home ownership. That is interesting. Uh, and so provision of this really deep, rich data and analysis to all players in the industry and government is a critical part of success and leadership in an industry. Now you've said you see this change, this movement, this is an opportunity to expand legal services and it provide, could provide greater opportunities for lawyers. Obviously, I certainly hear from many lawyers who contend that we should not acknowledge any of this movement, any of the things that are going on, um, that sure, are changing the way job. we deliver legal services. So if you could craft a message to, pe to the non-believers, those who might have their heads in the sand, what would be your message? How, how could, let me state it a different way. Yeah. How could you make it a positive message? It's so hard they, to make it. It's, it's hard to make it. I mean, it's not so hard. It, I mean, challenge, opportunity. You know, two sides of the same, two sides of the same coin. Uh, and you can say, the train's leaving the station, with or without us, this train is going. And you can get on board the train, or you can leave, get left behind, or get run over if you stand in the way. Um, and that's, that's the kind of, you know, that's the challenge message. The opportunity message is the message of market expansion and hope and, and learning new ways of, I mean, aren't we curious about new ways to deliver this service that we're trained to do? Um, you know, yes, we've always been doing it this way and circulated the papers in such and such a way and signed with this kind of pen. And I'm just I'm picking on that yeah, in particular. True. But, true. but, but, <laughs> but, you know, shouldn't we be interested and curious about these, these new technologies? Our kids are all using them. Well, what is Snapchat? Why, you know, what, why are there 200 million people using that? You know, like, it's, it's really interesting. And I find that if, if people keep an open, childlike, curious, learning-oriented mind, those are the people that are progressive in their thinking and leading the, new, leading the new revolution. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation so far, but it's not over. This is your chance now to ask questions of Rich and see, gain even greater insight in how we might maneuver <coughs> these uh, changing waters and and deliver a message to our profession and to others on the opportunities that are, that are there. So now's the time for questions. Who's first? Excuse me. I have two questions. Um, first, I, the biggest obstacle for a scalable solution in law in the area it's most needed, municipal courts where uh, People are losing their homes, losing their kids, because they, mainly because they don't have attorneys. Is that the fact that there's 4,000 municipal courts in this country, all with different rules? Um, is there any any of your ideas about how to deal with that? Is there similar things with the stuff you dealt with? And then, second question is that um, last night we heard a really powerful speech about how it's all of our responsibility to address uh, the discriminatory justice system we have now. And that's rooted in housing segregation. So if rooted, Zillow is such, rooted in what, sorry? Housing segregation. Yeah, right, okay. So if Zillow is such a powerful, uh, powerful influence in the real estate market, what is Zillow doing about housing segregation? I think the, your comment about the mortgage uh, interest tax is great. Yeah, right, Thank okay. Um, okay, with municipal courts, I really have no uh, I, I don't understand how that system works. Um, if I dug into it, I'm sure there would be obvious ways to streamline that and digitize that and make it more customer service oriented rather than probably how it is today, but I really don't know. Um, you guys probably do though. Uh, and I would encourage you guys to press on that hard. You know, as hard as it is to bring technology and progress and innovation to private industries, it's doubly hard, 10x hard, to bring it to uh, government, you know, public-oriented bureaucracy. It is really a giant legacy problem we have um, in all forms of delivery of, gov of government. 
And I think we're going to see over the next 50 years a complete rethinking of the way we deliver government. Otherwise, this government will be left behind. This, this, our society will be left behind and replaced by something, you know, a, a leadership of something else. Well, we there really is one to. bright spot out there. Legal Services Corporation has been at the forefront of innovation and delivery of legal services to the poor and the underserved. Jim Sandman's here and, and others from awesome. LSC, and they've actually been a model for many of us in the private sector on, and, and have many suggestions on single entry portals and other things using a lot, and, and a lot of it's uh, smartphone based. So. Yeah. I think smartphone is the key because the, the, the desktop PC, which many of us still think is the way we interact with the internet, you got to just forget that. You know, most customers, most of the, the you know, regular folks actually don't use desktop PCs much and maybe never even had them. But everybody's got a smartphone, okay? <laughs> everybody's got a smartphone. There'll be 1.5 billion mobile devices activated this year around the world. And a majority of those below the poverty line have a smartphone. That's absolutely. It's a high percentage. And it's the thing that they would, you know, they value that more than TV. They value it more than TV. They value it more than food. Yes. Uh, it's really interesting. And so uh, that is, I, I, applaud the, I applaud the folks in the room who are working on that, pushing that same ideal into the, into the court system and into the regu regulatory systems for licensing and all of these things is obviously, a, it's a paramount importance and I don't have great suggestions. I just don't, I haven't, I haven't tackled that one yet. Um, uh, discrimination, uh, yeah, I mean, the real estate industry and the redlining in the mortgage, in the mortgage business, you guys know what, what redlining is, um, where, you know, lending institutions would draw red lines and say, you know, people that live in that neighborhood are going to, we don't really want to loan in that neighborhood, and we, we, we're going to, if, if we do loan, give a mortgage, we're going to charge a higher rate. And by the way, maybe bad guys in charge who are doing tax assessments are going to assess, you know, assess those, those neighborhoods higher. Like all that has gone on. And there were a set of, of anti-redlining laws that happened back in the civil rights uh, time in the 60s, um, which have helped uh, immensely. Um, this kind of thing still does go on, we believe. And our solution to it at Zillow is radical transparency. Open all the information up for everybody to see, unvarnished, give it to everybody. That is, that is one of the great things Zillow has done, is simply crack open all industry information to everybody, so now anybody can do research on every topic like that. What do tax assessments looks like, look like by neighborhood? What do mortgage rates look like by neighborhood, et cetera? And we make it all available by API, um, uh, a, a, a digital interface, basically, for computers to plug into our databases and suck information out so that Third parties can do their own analyses. So I hugely believe in radical transparency. When bright sunshine is let in to the dark, moldy corners of the old house, <laughs> the mold dries up and the creepy crawlies scatter. So bright sunshine cures, cures a lot of that. Thank you. Wait, I think we have a question over here first, and then yeah, we'll sorry. go back to so, David so you, Andy. You, you may have started to answer my question. Well, one of the big problems that people have with Yelp is that they don't know how they figure out what Yelp will show you um, in terms of the uh, positive and negative reviews. So they have, a, they have an algorithm, but that's not transparent. So my question is, how can we trust you that your algorithms are showing us the data? Not just, I mean, I, I trust you that the data is, is transparent. But the algorithms that decide what we see, be it you, Google, Avo, what's the, yeah. what's the Avo algorithm for calculating those ratings? And, and that's a bigger question for, for all law software. You know, we, we, we need radical transparency in being able to see how it figured out that I am eligible for this service or not allowed to uh, use this thing or whatever, whatever that is. It's, it's, a great, it's a great question. Um, and. I mean, I think the answer mostly lies in that it becomes obvious to users when the provider of the data is cheating. It's pretty, it's, it becomes obvious, and when that becomes obvious to users, they go somewhere else. So if, if Yelp keeps, keeps <clears throat> uh, promoting restaurants that turn out to be bad, you're gonna go somewhere else for your reviews. 
Um, one of the great things about UGC, user-generated content, so Yelp reviews from diners, TripAdvisor reviews uh, uh, on hotels, etc., is that <clears throat> Glassdoor reviews on employers. Okay, is that that uh, we get so many reviews. There's so much liquidity in reviews, and they're so fresh that we can we can algorithmically clip the tails. And so what that means is we get so many reviews that anything that's too strident on either end, we just chop off and cut out. Okay? And, and anything that has a set of keywords that we search for algorithmically that are suspicious words, we queue up for a human to read the review and try to decide whether or not uh, it's legit. Anything that looks like there's one person who's never reviewed before came in and did 50 reviews, <clears throat> we, that gets flagged as, hmm, maybe that's a robot in Ukraine uh, who's doing those reviews. Okay, so we have all these mechanisms to make sure that we're running a clean game, but as soon as we're not running a clean game, consumers know and they're going to go elsewhere. I'll conclude this by saying that Google is in a, in a serious pickle right now on this one <coughs> because they do have consumers trust and they do take every opportunity they can to wrap themselves in the consumer flag do, be, do, do no evil all this kind of stuff but it is it is pretty clear that as the desktop search internet market matures they are and, and moves mobile that the business model isn't transitioning as well as they probably would like and they are beginning to be very aggressive about promoting advertised and their own services in Google search results. And they're going to go until consumers probably, consumers or governments, puke on that. Um, but I think they are, you know, they're getting pretty far along in that now. Um, the EC is actually, I'm sure you're all well aware, is, is looking into this right now. Um, I think it's something that we societally need to keep our eye on. David. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, Richard, this is fantastic, and uh, I think we'll all be better off, although much more uncomfortable for somebody like you getting in our market. I, I guess I want you to reflect a little bit on the relationship between, I guess what I'd call, Barton's laws and Barton's business model for how people yeah. in the law business are going to think about the system as a whole. So, uh, law number two is, if it can be free, it will be free. Uh, that's easier to say if all you're dealing with is the top of the funnel. Yeah. Uh, in other words, down funnel, it can't be free. At some level, if you're going to get people to produce it, particularly if you're going to get people to invest seven years of post high school education and let's say $200,000 just to buy a ticket to produce it. Yep. Um, so I guess I'm curious for you to think a little bit about how do people make money in a business where we can't just be rating, right? Because you've got to have somebody to rate, uh, and where the services have to be produced, and yet you have to make money in a new way or different ways, which is the way I think you were talking about the early movers. So just some reflection. Yeah. Great. Okay. Clearly, providing legal services can't be free. Um, you know, an edge case, though, is Jeff Bezos. Uh, who is mantra, who's Amazon guy, whose mantra is, your profit is my opportunity. Uh, you know, if Jeff Bezos can figure out how to, thinks that it's strategic to provide free legal services because it helps him, you know, sell more Prime memberships or something like that, then you actually do need to think about that. Now, I think it's fairly strategically far-fetched to think that Jeff Bezos or somebody like that will come in and provide the actual legal service for free as a, as a loss leader to some other business. Um, so I think that's relatively safe. Um, what may not be so safe is that transparency turns out to be a great kind of efficiency generator. Uh, and so pricing in a, in a radically transparent new digital marketplace, pricing tends to come under pressure. Okay, and that, you know, most traditional participants don't like that. They don't want to see comparison pricing lists. There's a lot of what the legal profession has done to make it actually super difficult to compare prices. 
and by nature of the delivery of the service, the unknown number of hours that it's going to take, you know, it is inherently difficult to compare price. But I will tell you that it, relative to where it is now, new digital transparent marketplaces will make it easier for, for clients to compare price. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure what the implications of that are, but people, you know, the professionals uh, should be aware of that. Um, so that's, I guess, something, something to watch for. Um, you know, one piece of advice. Thank you. Andy? Thank you very much. This has been fabulous. Great. Um, so I want to pick up on your point about the consumer cloak uh, and what the arguments are typically against that. What we hear in the legal industry, and I suspect that you hear it in other industries as well, uh, is that while the people who are arguing for more freedom and freedom from regulation are wearing the consumer cloak, the argument against that is that the regulations are supposed to protect the public and the consumers. Yeah. Um, and I think that's true, especially when you get down onto the service piece of things that David was referring to. Yeah. So what are the arguments, and because I assume you've heard these arguments before, what are the arguments that you raise in opposition to that point of view about what's necessary to protect the public? Yeah, okay. That's why we have smart people to, to parse these things, right? You know, Uber is a good example. I'm an investor via benchmark in, in Uber. And uh, it's a perfect example of what you're talking about, where clearly Uber comes into a town and the traditional entrenched taxi lobby uh, and regulatory system muscles up. Really? <laughs> and they use all tools at their disposal to keep Uber out and Lyft and, 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 and its ilk. Okay, and on one side you've got, well, consumers want Uber. They've had bad experiences with taxis for years. There aren't enough taxis because they, they monopolize the distribution of medallions in most cities, so they're too few which keeps prices artificially high and keeps interests entrenched. Clearly, it's a case in most cities around the world where the regulated and the regulators are in bed together. Okay? And so, what I see it, uh, although that said, the regulations around trying to protect riders and making sure that the drivers, you know, are not, don't have a history of, you know, bad behavior towards children or whatever that's gonna, that should prevent them from maybe being drivers or what have you, those are good, those are positive. And so Uber comes in and picks a fight in the city with the taxi commission. It gets a lot of light and heat and attention. In Seattle, like literally Uber was banned. And Seattle's really you know, progressively liberal as some of the, the Seattle people in the room know, right. And, and People went, like, consumers went nuts. You know, it went just crazy. All the you know, editorials in the paper and every twi a Twitter storm. And within uh, two weeks, I don't know what it was, within two weeks, the mayor came out and said, no, 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 just kidding. We're going <laughs> we're gonna to take, take care of this, which is so, so fantastic that that, that that happened. And so what needs to happen is these, these forces for progress come in and help modernize regulations to suit, suit, the, suit the times. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, Rich, thank you thank very you much. Well. That was a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it.